Ah. Ow. Sorry. I just got my wisdom teeth taken out. I'm on a lot of opiates. Notice anything different about me? Oh, you're fishing for a compliment. I have decided to become a vampire. Is that a thing you decide? Yep. I've given up on living in the daytime for a life of stalking the night, looking for a fresh meal. Now I crave blood. Fresh human blood. Oh yeah, the keto thing. I heard that's huge. What brought this on though? Another charmed marathon? Actually, I was looking through your cookbook stack. And I uh, found this. Cool. That is a DVD that my roommate left on the shelf full of stoned, probably. A what? Didn't you notice that, like, you know, it's not really about dieting. It's about a girl coming to grips with her place in a world that doesn't want to accept her, meeting a boy who loves her despite the world telling him to fear and hate her, and also that it's, like, not a book. Oh, so like a rom-com? Yeah, it's a real genre to fire. I mean, I really just related to the main character, her attitude, her anxieties. I got a whole Tumblr tag for bitches like this. Oh yeah, that, that tracks. You know, Brew, you don't have to chase after the latest trends in dieting or beauty regimens or supernatural and death. Sometimes all you need is to open yourself up to love someone else. And also, for the first time in your life, let them love you back. Yeah, I, I have a boyfriend. <sighs> okay, tried it the nice way. You like her because she's trans. What? So let's get one thing right out the gate and say the history of portrayal of trans and gender nonconforming people on screen is yucky at best. The first name that comes up in discussions about trans representation is often Buffalo Bill, a serial killer driven mad by medical gatekeeping and ashy elbows. It rubs the lotion on its skin. It does this whenever it's told. All right, enough, you broken record, okay? Trans people on screen oftentimes get to run the gamut from tragic yet noble urchins scraping a living through sex work and Jerry Springer appearances, or more drably, flat out actual monsters who kill people. In the scope of movie history, they're most commonly shown unwell, unlovable, and unfit for personal narratives. But man, do they make good Oscar fodder. But the portrayals are so superficial, so hollow. Where's the drama, the depth, the prosthetics? With all the manufactured self-loathing from storytellers who really don't know or care about what the trans experience actually entails, it really makes one wonder why can't we get the same on-screen attention as say Frankenstein or Nosferatu or Mike Myers. After all, as film has explored these monsters over and over, audiences have begun to ask for things like subtext and subtlety and for some reason seriousness. Even for movies with plotlines straight off the shelves of a spirit Halloween store. Enter the right one, whomst we've let in. Despite being weirdly paraded as the dark knight of vampire movies, let the right one in really thematically is more in common of a movie like 50 First Dates than, I don't know, whatever Bella Lugosi fucking did. And I just want to eat you up. It's the type of genre I tricked you move that suburban families with a copy of Little Miss Sunshine on their shelf would go gaga for. It's about a vampire, yes, but in between her snacking on some open veins, Ely is a character of a full-ass development arc, one that is mirrored by her relationship to the film's sloppy blonde protagonist, Oscar. You see, Oscar is kind of the wimpy, bullied kid, one with a suppressed violent streak and an emotionally distant and maybe gay dad. Things seem rough until the new girl who likes night walks, puzzle games, and trans flag couture moves into his apartment. Oscar and Ely have a burgeoning, childish relationship, but it's the one that drives the whole film. Their developments parallel each other. It's less about loving themselves and more about letting themselves be open to each other. Oscar drops his weird scrapbook of serial killers and redirects his lust for revenge into caring for his morally ambiguous vampire GF, while Ely lets herself be loved by someone who will literally cut a dude to save her ass. Their dynamic even starts out with the old romantic comedy trope of being pointlessly adversarial. But why this format for a monster movie? I mean, unless there's some kind of understated plotline to the film that would for some reason find a Venn diagram overlap of romance and terror particularly relevant, but- It's time for dating while trans! Oh sweet, where's the Mad Cats? Alright, contestants, you are in the throes of a second puberty. I need to take the edge off by finding someone who will maybe bed you down after listening to your opinions on art and PlayStation 2 role-playing games. Do you choose door number one? Or door number two. Uh, uh. Let's get it out of the way now. Dating sucks for most people. There's a lot of room for hurt egos, broken hearts, and revenge-based pop country songs. I took a Louisville slugger to both headlines. 
Dating while trans is that with its own extra pitfalls, bonus holes if you will. There's a lot of low-key paranoia you have with every message of like, is this dude chill? He spends a lot of time telling me about how banging Hari Neff's bot is. There's also the constant shoe drop moment of anxiety around being stealth, by which of course I mean, is this bitch a stealth turf? If you acquiesce to these paranoias, all of a sudden the dating pool shrinks into whatever friend circle adjacent weirdo you let put their mouth on you while you're rolling at that Halloween party. Does anybody have some molly? There's creeps, there's fetishists, there's chasers, and there's people processing who, God bless you, I know I know, but I'm trying to get laid here, not help someone fill out an informed consent form. And all of them are swimming in what feels like a pretty limited dating pool sometimes. I prefer to think of it as an exclusive pool, like one with a gate around it. Or that looks like this. Speaking of limited options, Ely starts the film in a codependent, cohabitative, questionably intimate relationship with Hakan, a man old enough to be mistaken for her literal father. While it's mostly left as an implication in the film that he's, you know, not here with the best intentions, the book goes really uncomfortably hard on making sure you know that he's involved with Ely because he's a guilt-stricken pedophile, one who sees her as a morally acceptable outlet for his predatory desires. In the film, this is consolidated into a vague ambience of a selfishly driven martyr complex, a man who's willing to die for her, but only because he doesn't really want to be identified as being with her. He never seems to really understand Ely, especially not that she's still a child, just an immortal one, and he treats her personal needs, sense of autonomy, and boundaries as just inconveniences to, well, his fantasy of what their relationship should be. Turns out the yucky power dynamic between a fetishistic pedophile and his edge case object of desire isn't necessarily cut any favors by immortal undeath. In the book, there's a sequence where Hakan, while pouring acid over his face, imagines Ely specifically as a young boy angel taking him up into heaven, a point that directly links his dual fetishizing gazes on Ely, casting her both as not a real child and not a real woman. How does that play out in the movie? Oh, it just kind of doesn't. The movie cuts a lot of stuff out, actually. Ely's backstory is removed, there's entire character arcs simmered down to a fine reduction. Hakan actually doesn't even die from the fall in the book. Ely's bite turns him immortal, so he ends up as a monstrous mountain of meat with a permanent erection on the run from the police, only ended up trapped in a basement with Oscar's friend, also removed from the film, who's given the Sisyphean task of repeatedly smashing his unkillable flesh over and over with a trophy until daybreak. Oh, you know, this reminds me of something. Hold on. The corpse, seen without God and outside of science, is the utmost of abjection. It is death infecting life, abject. It is something rejected from which one does not part, from which one does not protect oneself as from an object. Imaginary uncanniness and real threat, it beckons to us and ends up engulfing us. Is that Taylor Swift? No, it, it's Julia Kristeva describing a notion she calls abjection. We start out with the idea of the subject and the object. The subject is the actor, the object is the thing being acted upon. Oh, so like, if I were to punch you, you'd be the object and I'd be the subject. Sure, that act of violence would also create a very simple unmuddled boundary that describes you as the puncher and me as the punchee. Well, what if in this situation you replace me with a dead body? Yeah, gross. There it was! There what was? An immediate physical reaction of disgust that preempted any logical response. The same thing that happens when you encounter shit, decay, or just plain bad tasting food. You reject the dead body, because dead bodies are gross. Yeah, being reminded of my physical materiality stinks. Like, awful. Can we crack a window in here? If the dead body by existing shows you a truth that you're unable to reject, who's to say you're not the object and the dead body the subject? As the boundaries between you and everything that isn't you crumble, you're left with madness and chaos. Uh, no, it's still just a dead body. And it's gross because it smells bad. Yeah, you're right, I guess biblical thinking isn't useful here. Still, though, it's an interesting thought. You know what else is an interesting thought? How film theorist Barbara Creed explored the relationship between objection and horror film in her essay, Horror and the Monstrous Feminine. No, 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 I, I was gonna get back to the- She argues that the horror film exists to allow us to confront the process of objection and reconsider how we're affected by concepts that rigid social models have taught us to find disgusting. The living corpse in the body or without soul are common subjects of horror films for basically being regarded as a form of pollution by most religions. You know what else is an interesting thought? Whatever thoughts went into the decision to mostly abandon Ely's backstory. Well, I mean, it's not really that relevant, right? Same reason they cut out the living boner meat in an explanation of whatever this is. The film focuses so much on the risky tightrope act of Ely and Oscar's relationship. Ely paradoxically needs safety from Oscar as much as she needs to be safe from Oscar. You're right, there's no telling what could happen to Ely if 
if she trusts Oscar too much too quickly. This is a small town in Sweden, after all. We don't know how Oscar's mom would react to bringing home a vampire girlfriend who keeps you up all night and was castrated by a Marquis de Sade figure over a thousand years ago. Probably poorly. Oh, wait a minute, what was that about? You see, the original author of the book, Jan Abid Lidvist, has said that he's interested in androgynous characters, but doesn't really seem to be aware of, well, what kind of people he's writing when he does so. Here's what he had to say about Ely. I knew from the beginning that Ely was a boy. What happened when I let Ely meet Oscar was that Ely started to change his behavior from what I had originally envisioned. Since Oscar perceives Ely as a girl, Ely is content with not informing him otherwise, although he can't help himself on a few occasions. Ely doesn't want to fool Oscar. He is uncertain if Oscar is going to label him when he comes out. This unbelievably stupid way of talking about the fact that Ely obviously is also living as a girl and pretty happy being treated as a girl and is a girl is pretty much entirely absent from the film along with the rest of her history so we're just left with Ely being a girl and well that shot. Wait a second when I watched the movie as an impressionable youth in the late aughts I didn't catch that castration was implied by the one second blank and he missed a shot of a child vampire's mutilated genitals that we're not going to show in this video for exceedingly obvious reasons. I thought that was just the screenwriter s saying that I actually have no idea what I thought. Are you saying the character is literally transgender? Well, yes and no, because you see, she was castrated against her will hundreds of years before the timeline of the story and chose to live as a girl. In the original Swedish text, she's referred to with neutral pronouns by everyone but Oscar, who not only sees her as a girl, but also as a child in a way nobody else does. And this is part of the way in which he also accepts Ely for who she literally is, except in the book when the author suddenly switches to male pronouns for like a few chapters, including from Ely's perspective, enough though she doesn't even really see herself as anything because of the whole undead monster thing and like obviously she likes that oscar doesn't treat her as an undead monster so she kind of just is a trans woman in every way except what john avici lion quest says even the terrible american adaptation was supposed to be shortened to let her in until john complained that it's not technically true oh come on death of the author no one cares what that old bastard thinks they come to these videos to know what we think and as far as i'm concerned this bitch is batting for our team now it makes sense the trust issues, the preemptive disclosure, trouble meeting new people. Yeah, and stripped of all the boring, dumb, and Ricean lore of the books, we just have Ely as a girl who was maybe living as a boy before she transitioned. Transitioned to being a creature of the night, I mean. Yeah, same thing. Monstrosity and transness are commonly associated, particularly by trans creators. It's actually kind of a thing that's been going on for a while. But who can we point to as our monstrous mother? Susan Stryker's essay, My Words to Victor Frankenstein Above the Village of Chamonix, Performing Transgender Rage, draws comparisons between the transgender body and Frankenstein's monster, bodies reconstructed by medical science that call into question the purpose of a body in the first place. This rhetorical device for context was a direct response to second wave feminists using similar rhetoric to derogatorily draw attention to trans people who sought medical treatment, specifically Mary Daly, who called trans healthcare a Frankenstein phenomenon. To encounter the transsexual body is to risk a revelation of the constructedness of the natural order. Confronting the implications of this constructedness can summon up all the violation, loss, and separation inflicted by the gendering process that sustains the illusion of naturalness. Okay, you're kind of just referencing a lot of essays and theoretical jargon. Can you try rephrasing your point in a way that's, like, actually useful to anyone? Look, you can Facebook comment argument up and down on whether being trans is a choice and what that means. But transitioning, particularly medical transition, is a choice, informed by unchosen feelings of dysphoria or not. We don't do this shit for no reason. If the construction of a natural order to protect the boundaries between society and chaos, reinforced by objection of ideas deemed disgusting, is unilaterally destructive to free personal expression of- Whoa, whoa, whoa wait, are you saying you transitioned just because you wanted to protest limiting predatory social hierarchies? What are you, a transgender? What is this? Tumblr? I think that like it or not, protest is inherent to the process of transition. And I think that's really interesting and really cool. The growing popularity of trans creators and their work in both mainstream and fringe communities maybe provides a good opportunity to examine how the one size fits all way we define ourselves are outdated. Accepting and rejecting outside ideas as a process of developing the self is really fulfilling. The parts of that process where other people make those decisions for you really sucks ass. 
The condition of Ely's monstrosity is shown in a lot of ways to be an obstacle. It leads to her horrifying relationship with Hakan, new friends are mostly off the table, and while the stuff with Oscar seems to turn out fine, she seems content with the suitcase at the end, it's a lot more of a complicated discussion than adult man, adult woman, home, kids, dog. It's painful and difficult to be a monster, and every day seems to present new problems for her. In the book, Ely seeks out other older vampires and is told that her only option is essentially suicide, something Ely refuses. Whether she knows it or not, through her continued existence, you see in her hope for love and opportunity, which, for a trans girl vampire, is pretty radical. The following passage from Susan Stryker's essay is, in my opinion, a poignant, touching look at the trans internal monologue. This shit really isn't all roses and sunshine, so the faint of heart may want to tap out before it gets kinda real. I'm so tired of this ceaseless movement. I do war with nature. I'm alienated from being. I'm a self-mutilated deformity, a pervert, a mutant, trapped in monstrous flesh. God, I never wanted to be trapped yeah. again. I've destroyed myself. I'm falling into darkness. I'm falling apart. I enter the realm of my dreams. I'm underwater. Swimming upward, it's dark. I see a shimmering light above me. I break through the plane of the water's surface with my lungs bursting. I suck for air and I find only more water. My lungs are full of water, inside and out. I'm surrounded by it. Why am I not dead if there is no difference between me and what I am in? There is another surface above me. I swim frantically towards it. I see shimmering light. I break the plane of the water's surface over and over again. This water annihilates me. I cannot be and yet an excruciating impossibility. I am. I will do anything not to be here. I will swim forever. I will die for eternity. I will learn to breathe water. I will become the water. If I cannot change my situation, I will change myself. In this act of magical transformation, I recognize myself again. I am groundless, I am boundless movement. I am furious flow. I am one with the darkness and the wet. I am enraged. She did murder some kids though, that was kind of extra. They're gonna drown her boyfriend, cut a bitch some slack. Thank you so much for making it all the way to the end of another Film Critters. Or just skipping here, whatever. We're actually super excited to announce that this takes a lot of time and energy to put together, and that kind of makes it hard on both of us to be consistent in an upload. But you're in luck, because we're rolling out a brand new way that you, the viewer at home, can incentivize us to entertain you, and read literally hundreds of pages of film theory to find quotes for our funny movie blog. We got a Patreon! You can check it out down below, or keep an eye out for our separate announcement video we'll probably make at some point. If you like this video or other videos, us, my posts, Bruce's posts, this post, please take a moment to look it over and decide if you want to help support us or not. We want to be able to make these more often than just whenever we have time, and this is going to be the best way you can get involved in making that happen. Thank you again for your time and all your comments and pushing buttons that give us dopamine. We appreciate each and every one of you, and hopefully you'll see us again next month. Okay, I love you. Bye-bye. <laughs>